All right. Hello, everyone, wherever you are. Welcome to this uh, new edition of the Worldwide uh, Neuro Forum. Today's uh, guest is uh, Maria Tosques from Columbia um, University. Um, I'll start as usual. I'm going to cut um, through the instruction manual. I think uh, it's, this is now the fourth or fifth edition. Uh, you guys all know you can comment live. You also know that you can ask questions and you know that you can uh, vote on um, the question that you think is of most interest. So by saying that, I just said what I, that I just did what I said I wouldn't do. So I gave you the instruction. But <laughs> it's the last time. Uh, next time you'll have to figure it out on your own. So, uh, Maria, it's a pleasure to, to, to welcome you here. Uh, before I, I give you the, the full screen for, for you to um, tell us about your research, I'm, I'm going to say a few words about you. Uh, so, Maria um, was born and raised in a, in a small village in the south of Italy, in Puglia. I think I'm pronouncing it right. She studied biology in, um, in Pisa, the University of Pisa, and the Scuola Normale Superiore. Superiore that's maybe less well pronounced. And after her master's, she moved to Heidelberg, where she worked um, with Beth Detlef Arendt um, at the EMBL. And back then, she was working on an uh, invertebrate system, uh, a marine worm. Uh, did the first uh, G-Camp experiments, so live imaging experiments on, on, on this species. And she was telling me um, about some exotic kind of um, uh, uh, visits she had to do back then. At some point, she wanted to um, renew the um, the stock of worms in the lab and had to uh, take a trip with two other uh, PhD uh, colleagues in the lab. And she spent a, a few days on the beach trying to catch those worms, didn't work. And in, in the end, had to take a boat in un unclear circumstances, go by <laughs> night and, 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 and scoop up uh, these, uh, these strange uh, worms from the bottom of the ocean. Anyway, it seemed quite, quite, uh, quite exotic uh, and, and in fact, interesting and, and fascinating. So you never know where where science will bring you to. Uh, in, in 2014, she um, started her postdoc with Gilles Laurent at the Max Planck Institute uh, in Frankfurt, and then did some, some really interesting work um, uh, aimed at um, understanding the single cell biological differences between different types of, um, of, uh, of animals. And she'll be telling us, I think, about this today, in particular, turtles and lizards. Uh, Maria has had a busy couple of, uh, of months. Uh, she moved to uh, the Department of Biology at Columbia, uh, New York City, in September 2019, and basically was caught by the, by the COVID uh, pandemics uh, while, in essence, setting up. So uh, pretty uh, intense couple of months, I'm sure. Uh, we were chatting again, and um, she was telling me about the challenges to keep the, the, the links between the lab members when the lab members themselves maybe I haven't even met uh, for real together. So uh, I, I'm sure this is a lot of uh, energy on, on your part, Maria, and we're, we're, um, we're sure you're, you're going to manage that very, very efficiently. One word, uh, she is hiring. Um, and so if um, you are a talented postdoc or PhD student uh, and interested in what Maria is going to tell us about, uh, please do get in touch with her. One last thing, uh, since 2018, she's been um, elected a next generation leader uh, at the Allen Institute. For those of you who are not familiar with this, um, this is a group of, uh, of young and talented neuroscientists, mostly from the US, but not exclusively, um, that get together on a regular basis to um, discuss uh, upcoming challenges and, and, and priorities in, in neuroscience. So very lively and, and a creative uh, group. So I'll stop there. Um, Maria, um, welcome. The, the screen is yours. Uh, what I suggest is you um, share your screen and we'll go through what we've rehearsed. <laughs> Voila, so you can make it full screen. Okay. Good. And can you hear me well? Let me just, voila, yeah, it's all good. Uh, you, you, the world is yours. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So thank you, Denis, for, uh, for the invitation and for the kind introduction. And thank you, everyone, for, um, for connecting and coming today. Uh, so as Denis said, I, I started my lab uh, a few months ago. And what I'm going to tell you today is uh, mostly uh, about my, my work as a postdoc with Gilles Laurent at the Max Planck. 
uh, but I'm trying to connect, I will try to connect this to what we, we plan to do in the lab and I will spend the last couple of minutes talking about future plans. So my lab uh, is in general interested in the question of uh, how have cell types evolved in the vertebrate nervous system, more specifically in the forebrain, and uh, what are the implications of um, changes of uh, molecular properties, molecular identities of cell types on uh, the evolution of cortical circuits. Uh, so what we where we would like to go uh, in the future is also uh, into more functional studies where we connect uh, cell types that we can study molecularly with their function in circuits and in the, in the nervous system. So um, I think this is a, uh, that studying brain evolution in general is extremely important for understanding the brain. That's the big question uh, of neuroscience. How does the brain work? And uh, to give you a sense of uh, how I think about this, I want to start with, uh, with an analogy. Uh, I come from Italy and there is this uh, square in Italy, Piazza Navona, that has a very counterintuitive shape. It is very elongated. If you come uh, from one side, you don't see the people on the other side. Now, uh, an engineer, an architect would never uh, design a square like that because the purpose of squares is to get people to, or to meet and to uh, get together. Um, so the, you can understand why this, uh, this square looks like that. It doesn't look like a square, so it's, it's so elongated. If you look at its history, it used to be a place where um, the Romans, more than 2,000 years ago, were having uh, contact with boats and uh, they were filling up this space with, with water, actually. And uh, so this was used as a space for uh, races. And, uh, and then this square has been repurposed uh, later as a, uh, as a um, square, you know, as it is now, nowadays. So this is a good example of how, um, in a way, of how evolution works. Uh, evolution doesn't work by design. Uh, brains are not designed to be the optimal uh, systems to, uh, to perform certain functions and uh, certain computations. But uh, at any given time point, evolution is reusing, repurposing, tinkering with what's already there. So there are many aspects of brain organization and uh, brain anatomy that can be understood only uh, from the lens of evolution. And uh, this is what uh, motivates our work. If you look at the vertebrate brain, um, you, and you look at the big picture, it's clear that uh, vertebrates have uh, retained the same overall brain architecture despite their 500 million years of evolution. Uh, you can uh, recognize in uh, every vertebrate from fish to mammal, ethylencephalon, uh, optic tectum, midbrain. So all these big subdivisions. And this is remarkable because um, the, uh, the evolutionary distances are, are really big. In these same 500 million years, for example, if you look at mollusks, uh, nervous systems have been reinvented over and over for uh, multiple times. Uh, instead, uh, the vertebral nervous system uh, seems to have a very uh, constrained uh, evolution. And that can be traced back to the fact that, um, okay, to the fact that uh, the early architecture of uh, the vertebral nervous system is set up at an embryonic stage that is uh, highly constrained developmentally. This is uh, the phylotypic stage that is referred, um, if you are familiar with the, uh, our glass hypothesis, is the stage where vertebrate embryos look more similar to each other. At this stage, uh, conserved signaling pathways and uh, gene regulatory cascades organize the early nervous system and subdivide the nervous system into these different territories, the rhombomeres uh, in the more posterior region and uh, prosomeres uh, more anteriorly. And these different um, regions are already specified uh, to, for, uh, and will acquire um, the, uh, a certain fate. For example, the telencephalon as a whole is, is specified at these uh, early stages. However, what not happens next is that uh, there is a divergence of developmental programs that leads to the diversification of cell types, uh, to the divergence of neural circuits, and even to the elaboration of different tissue architectures. These are differences that build up uh, during development, and how these differences are building up, how do these uh, developmental programs diverge, 
to produce the diversity of, uh, uh, of nervous systems that we see in vertebrates nowadays, it's, it's not very well uh, explored. And this is one of the questions that uh, we are interested in understanding. We are particularly focused on uh, understanding what's uh, unique about the mammalian brain by using the comparative approach. And, when, uh, and that's simply because we ourselves, uh, humans are mammals. And uh, if you look at the history of vertebrates, and it's also remarkable to see that mammals uh, originated very long ago. Um, they share a common ancestor with, uh, with reptiles and birds. Um, this was about uh, 320 uh, 20 million years ago. And this, um, and this split happened a few million years uh, after, uh, after the split between amphibians, the amphibian ancestors, and the rest of uh, terrestrial vertebrates. Um, so it's clear that these, uh, this was an epoch of uh, um, accelerated evolution, of uh, great innovation in vertebrate lineage. And this innovation was fueled by the transition from uh, an aquatic lifestyle to a terrestrial lifestyle. So to us, understanding these uh, transition points uh, seems particularly relevant to understand uh, what makes the mammalian uh, brain in particular um, so um, different from uh, other vertebrate brains. So I'm going to tell you today about um, my work on, uh, on three species. And uh, two species are uh, reptilian species that I worked on as a postdoc. The bearded dragon, uh, Pogona viticeps, that comes from Australia, and uh, the common uh, uh, eared slider turtle that can be found in uh, more or less any pond here in the United States. And um, my lab is now starting working on a new system. It's an amphibian, uh, the salamander, more specifically the newt, Pleurodelis valtel. And uh, as I said, I will, uh, I will say something more about this at the end of the presentation. So as a reminder, uh, uh, lizards and turtles are reptiles. Uh, birds are they also, uh, they're also reptiles that uh, <laughs> they, they evolved the capacity of, uh, of flying. And so all these uh, are sauropsis that diverged more than 280 million years ago. And uh, what's important to, no to notice here is that uh, lizards and turtles belong to very two very distinct branches of the reptilian tree. So the comparison of these two uh, is informing us about very uh, deep um, branches of uh, vertebrate evolution. And uh, sauropsids together with mammals are amniotes, um, and uh, amniotes together with uh, amphibians are tetrapods. And, and uh, tetrapods um, started the transition from water to land about 350 million years ago. This is very long ago. If we look at the telencephalon of, um, of these animals, we can uh, easily recognize the dorsal region, uh, which is uh, the dorsal telencephalon or pallium. Uh, the dorsal telencephalon is made of uh, glutamatergic neurons and of gabalgic neurons that originate in the subpallium, in the ventral part of the telencephalon, and then uh, during development migrate up to the pallium. And um, you, as you can see already from, uh, from these pictures, uh, there is a wide diversity in uh, morphology and archi architecture uh, between the pallia of different tetrapods. However, we can recognize some common features. So the dorsal part of the pallium um, is organized into a layered structure in reptiles and in mammals, uh, which we call cortex. And um, cortex is really spanning from the, uh, from the me most medial part of the pallium, which, is the, which corresponds to the hippocampus in mammals, all the way to the lateral cortex that uh, corresponds to the piriform cortex in mammals. And uh, there is no layered organization in uh, uh, other uh, vertebrates besides uh, reptiles and mammals. And that's something I, I will discuss uh, more at the end. And, just to give you a sense of, uh, of these cortices, the six-layered uh, mammalian cortex is, uh, is very well known. Um, it, has, um, it has this kind of organization uh, where uh, cell types essentially arrange, uh, are arranged by layer. The three-layered mammalian uh, reptilian cortex is in reality a cortex made of one layer of, uh, of cell bodies of somatas um, and two layers uh, with a few sparse uh, interneurons and uh, fibers, axons and dendrites from, uh, from the rest of the neurons. 
And one long-standing question in, um, in comparative neuroscience has been uh, if the three-layered organization of the cortex is ancestral, how uh, has uh, the mammalian lineage acquired a more complex six-layered cortex? So these, this problem has been heavily debated uh, in the field since nearly 100 years, and uh, that's the problem we, we approached um, with our work on single-cell transcriptomics. But there is more to it because part of the uh, there is another part of the telencephalon, which um, it's called in uh, reptiles the DVR uh, dorsal ventricular ridge, that is also part of this story. So the dorsal ventricular ridge is this very large uh, part of the of the pallium that develops from uh, the most lateral and ventral subdivisions of the embryonic pallium. And uh, it's really dominating the pallium of reptiles and birds. Indeed, uh, all the high level um, process, processing of sensory stimuli, like visual processing, uh, take place in, uh, in the dorsal ventricular ridge. And there is nothing that resembles a dorsal ventricular ridge in a, in a mammalian brain. Uh, and there are different uh, ideas on uh, uh, what the DVR might be homologous to in the mammalian brain. I will discuss that in a second. But what I wanted to, to mention now is that um, from the, this ventral and lateral most part of the embryonic pallium uh, in mammals gives rise to other nuclei um, that uh, are, for example, the claustrum and uh, some of the amygdala nuclei. And they don't have a layered organization, but they are still part of the, of the pallium from their uh, embryological origin. So uh, why does this DVR matter uh, in the whole story? Because there are um, two main conflicting hypotheses on the evolution of pallium and cortex, and um, they are based on different sets of data. One uh, line of reasoning is uh, heavily influenced by data on embryonic development, um, as I just discussed. Um, that is, and this line of reasoning states that uh, regions of the pallium that share, uh, that come from homologous subdivisions medial pallium, dorsal pallium, or lateral pallium are homologous. So according to this hypothesis, then the reptilian DVR would be homologous to, uh, to the classroom and to the pallium amygdala. That's also called, for this reason, the classroom amygdala hypothesis. However, uh, there's a, a different uh, set of hypotheses uh, that uh, relies much more on axonal projection data. So looking at the, uh, how information is, um, is, is processed in uh, in these uh, telencephalic brain structures, what are the inputs uh, to these cells and what are the outputs of these cells? And uh, the neocortex is organized in layers. Layers have different um, molecular identities, but also different input-output connectivity. Uh, layer 2, 3 is mostly made of uh, intracortical, in, intratelencephalic projection neurons. Layer 4 receives uh, inputs from thalamus. Uh, layer 5 and layer 6 are made of neurons that project outside the telencephalon. And um, by looking at uh, these connectivity patterns, uh, people like Harvey Carton initially, and uh, also Cliff Ragsdale and others more recently, have suggested that uh, the dorsal cortex of reptiles uh, contains homologs of layer five and layer four, um, organized in different regions instead of being organized in the, uh, on overlapping layers. And, but they also suggested that uh, because the dorsal ventricular ridge uh, contains thalamo recipient uh, neurons and uh, um, cortical uh, fugal neurons, uh, also the DVR um, is uh, at some homology relationship at the cell, cell type level with the neocortex. So the, these two hypotheses don't uh, um, are in conflict with each other and. Uh, it essentially highlights uh, one of the challenges of, of this comparative neuroscience field, which is integrating uh, different uh, lines of evidence in one coherent um, and unifying scenario. And the, the piece of data that was really missing here was a good systematic characterization of, of cell types going beyond uh, the analysis of axonal projection data. Because uh, at the end of the day, we don't know uh, how how plastic uh, in, uh, in development and evolution axonal projections really are, but we uh, we can uh, we can set up we can compare cell types uh, on the basis of multiple characteristics and not just axonal projection data. 
Neurons uh, have complex phenotypes, and these phenotypes uh, can be analyzed from um, different points of view. You can look at neurotransmitters, you can compare electrophysiological properties, uh, connectivity, more, also morphology, and the position in the brain and the uh, developmental or origin. And uh, these phenotypes are, uh, can be associated to the expression of gene modules, uh, gene batteries that uh, determine, uh, that, that specify uh, these different phenotypes. And uh, we were talking about gene uh, models or um, gene families such as ion channels, receptors, uh, cell adhesion molecules, and so on. But ultimately, all these uh, gene modules uh, are uh, turned on in differentiated neurons by uh, transcription factors that define, specify, and maintain neuronal identity. So in other words, if you want to uh, define the identity of a neuron, uh, then uh, you want to look at uh, the expression of these transcription factors in particular, because they are the ones that instruct uh, neuronal identity and determine what a neuron is. Um, so uh, this conceptual framework, which is, of course, is not perfect and it's going to evolve as we get more data, and uh, uh, in particular with single cell transcriptomics and other techniques, uh, it's at least a, a good starting point uh, for um, looking at uh, cell types in a more comprehensive way, for comparing cell types across species and start to think about how cell type evolution uh, can uh, contribute to, understand, uh, to understanding cortex evolution and uh, telencephalon evolution more in general. And so um, just to, to to give a conceptual framework for how we think about cell type evolution and how we think uh, we can use uh, transcriptomics data um, to reconstruct cell type phylogenies. I want to give some theoretical, some extreme examples. So you can, for example, compare two neurons, see that they have the same phenotype uh, in two different species. The phenotype is indicated in color, it's just a schematic. And that uh, these neur neurons have the same uh, transcription factors uh, that specify their identity. So the most parsimonious interpretation in this case would be that uh, these neurons are homologous because they uh, they evolved from they come from uh, the same uh, from a same neuron that was present in the last common ancestor of these two species. And by contrast, you can imagine a situation of cell type convergence where you have neurons with same phenotypic properties. Uh, these phenotypic properties might even be um, represented in the transcriptome by the expression of the same effector genes, those ion channels, signaling molecules, uh, cell adhesion molecules I was just talking about. But uh, when you look at the regulatory transcriptome, uh, at the transcription factors that turn on these uh, effector genes, you see that uh, these transcription factors are completely different. So and in this case, uh, from a cell type um, standpoint, the most inter uh, persimonious interpretation would be that um, these cell types have evolved convergently uh, because their identity was, um, was, not, was not present in a common ancestor of these two species. And of course, things are more nuanced. Uh, cell types evolve themselves in the same way as genes or species evolve. And, um, and you can also, um, and one of the, you know, the hardest problems in uh, evolutionary biology is, uh, is, is to explain, is not to explain homology, but actually to, how to explain uh, the origin of new uh, structures, in this case, of new cell types. So cell type novelty, um, which is something that we haven't fully understood, but uh, one way to start thinking about this is to, um, to imagine this um, uh, in, a, in analogy to uh, the, the evolution of new genes. So new genes can evolve by duplication and then divergence. And in a similar way, you can uh, imagine that new cell types can evolve by uh, duplication and divergence of their regulatory programs. Uh, so that's a process we call uh, cell type diversification, where we, um, where, we, where we expect or we postulate that in a certain evolutionary lineage, the reshuffling of regulatory networks uh, that specify a neuronal identity can lead to the evolution of new cell type identities. So with this framework in mind, uh, I still want to remind uh, you of the challenge of uh, synthesizing uh, all these available data because uh, looking at cell types is just one uh, way we can look at um, anatomy and basically the phenotype. Uh, and the, the mapping between uh, gene expression and genotype 
And all these different levels of phenotype is not trivial and is not easy. We don't know which uh, aspects of the phenotype are more evolvable, which ones are more constrained. And so again, I want to stress the fact that uh, this is one way to look at the data, but we should not forget about uh, all the other data that are there and uh, the challenges to, uh, to find a parsimonious synthesis of all the data available. And this is, uh, this is a principle that has guided us uh, quite heavily in, uh, uh, in our analysis and understanding of the single cell data that I'm just going to present. So what we asked is, uh, what, uh, what are the reptilian cortical glutamatergic and cabergic types? And what, what is their relationship to mammalian types? And can we understand something about the evolution of uh, morphological novelties such as layering uh, from looking at these uh, cell types identities? And finally, what's the nature of this mysterious uh, sauropsid specific structure that is the dorsal ventricular ridge? And we, for doing that, uh, we collected data from, uh, from turtles. This is a, a plot that shows uh, single cell transcriptomes uh, embedded in a low dimensional and representation where each cell is a, is a dot and cells are um, in cellular proximity indicates uh, similarity of the transcriptomes and uh, colors indicate clusters. So here uh, we sequenced um, nearly 20,000 cells uh, from, uh, from the pallium of turtles and we uh, identified clusters of uh, um, glial cells uh, like ephendimoglial uh, cells or uh, oligodendrocytes and several clusters of excitatory neurons here and inhibitory neurons. More recently, we collected uh, data from the entire brain of, uh, of the Australian lizard, and these data are still um, in um, are still being analyzed. Uh, but uh, I will um, I will tell you what we learned uh, about uh, the pallium evolution, uh, also using uh, parts of this data set. To make sense of this uh, single cell transcriptomics data, one thing that we had to do and uh, that was a substantial investment of our time was to uh, generate gene expression atlases for the turtle and the lizard brain. Because uh, in contrast to uh, mouse researchers, for example, that can um, go to the Allen brain atlas and uh, check uh, the expression pattern of their genes of interest, we didn't have that kind of information. So uh, we needed, uh, because in the single cell work, you, you essentially make a soup of, uh, of cells and you lose information on their spatial origin, we needed to reconstruct that information. And so what uh, we did was an extensive, um, uh, in situ visualization screen where we uh, analyzed uh, dozens of gene expression patterns in, uh, uh, in the turtle and in the lizard brain. And um, we selected genes on the basis of their um, expression in the single cell data. So we focused on those genes that were expressed in a small number of clusters and that were, or maybe even uniquely in just one cluster. And so these were the genes that were the most informative genes for us. Uh, and it was useful genes for associating clusters to uh, tissue origin. So by doing this exercise, for example, we were able to, um, to assign the tissue origin of all these turtle neuronal clusters that you see in different colors here to the different parts of the pallium. So for example, by looking at the expression of uh, a gene that is very, uh, that is specific, it's unique to this uh, sets of clusters in the anterior DVR here in yellow and it's not expressed uh, anywhere else, we, uh, we realized that uh, these cells um, came from the DVR because we found that this gene was indeed expressed only in, uh, in DVR tissue and uh, nowhere else. So this map has been uh, our roadmap and has been uh, critical um, because it has um, guided our uh, comparative analysis um, later on. So for now, um, I will first talk about the dorsal cortex because uh, the dorsal cortex, this dorsal part of the pallium is um, unambiguously uh, associated to um, or compared to the mammalian uh, neocortex. And so what we wanted to do now is to use um, the, the data and the clusters coming from, uh, from this brain region and, and compare them to, to mammalian data, to, to the clusters and of cell types uh, sampled from uh, the mammalian neocortex. And um, just a, yes, as a reminder, 
the, the dorsal cortex of, uh, of reptiles is uh, composed of glutamatergic and gabergic neurons, the glutamatergic neurons in layer two, the gabergic neurons spread uh, more or less evenly across layers. Uh, the gabergic neurons are uh, inhibitory interneurons. They come in a variety of shapes um, and which have been partially characterized in the 80s by uh, the lab of uh, Kriegstein. Whereas uh, the glutamatergic neurons um, are um, typical pyramidal neurons with some differences to, in the extent of uh, their, um, uh, their dendritic fields. Some have more... Uh, more developed basal dendrites, some have, have uh, fewer basal dendrites, but overall uh, they are more uh, homogeneous in terms of uh, morphology. So uh, let's start with gabergic neurons. Um, as in, uh, so in reptiles and mammals, gabergic neurons are very diverse, but they can be classified in, uh, in four main classes uh, that are um, roughly related to uh, the embryonic origin. So two classes of gabergic neurons come from the medial ganglionic eminence in the subpallium, and two classes come from the caudal ganglionic eminence. This is uh, what you see here is um, a data set from mice, uh, from the Allen Institute, where um, I show the mark some of the marker genes that have been very well characterized uh, in the mammalian literature with, for example, uh, genetic exper knockout experiments. Many of these are transcription factors uh, indicated in red, and those transcription factors have been shown to be uh, essential for uh, specifying uh, the identity of these different gabergic types. So you can see that these genes alone are sufficient to discriminate uh, the, um, the three main classes of gabergic neurons, the differences between these two uh, CG derived types is more nuanced. So let's focus on these three main classes. So what we did um, is to take the same list of genes and to take the gabergic neurons uh, that we sampled from turtles and ask, uh, are these genes sufficient to identify clusters of uh, gabergic neurons? And the answer was surprisingly yes. So we do see that uh, these mammalian markers alone are re do recapitulate the classification of uh, gabergic neurons in uh, uh, PV type, somatostatin type, and serotonin receptor types. Um, so that's indicating, already suggesting that uh, the same types of gabergic neurons exist in reptiles and mammals. Of course, you might say this was a, um, a biased analysis because we've taken only uh, marker genes selected from the literature. What happens if you compare uh, entire transcriptomes? We've done that. We've done that initially using correlation metrics, which are, are not perfect, but were the best at the time. And now we've moved to more sophisticated tools that uh, enable us to align these uh, this highly dimensional data sets in the transcriptomic space. So what you can do is to take um, the single cell data sets from different species, find um, the genes that drive shared vari variation, and use that to uh, bring these two data sets together in the same uh, multidimensional space and see how cells from the two species align to each other. And this is just uh, an example uh, where we've taken uh, the gabergic cells from Liz the new lizard data set that I mentioned at the beginning and uh, gabergic cells from mouse. We brought them together in the same space and the same transcriptomic space. And we see that they do align. So here the color indicates the species. Uh, we see, for example, this cluster appears made of lizard and mouse gabergic neurons. And then when we look at, uh, when we compare uh, these, uh, the neurons derived from uh, lizards and from mouse, we see indeed that their transcriptomes have high correlation. So these, these methods um, are working well because they, they are, uh, we see that uh, they are not overfitting the data. They essentially um, align together only cells that have similar transcriptomes. But they have, uh, they are much more sensitive than just looking at uh, a simple correlation. And you can, uh, for example, recluster this data and ask uh, in the new clusters, how much do the original lizard clusters and mouse clusters overlap? And for example, for these uh, clusters up here that I'm indicating with the pointer, we see that there's a high overlap between um, the original lizard and mouse clusters. So that's uh, supporting the idea that this cell type was present already in uh, this gabergic type was already present in the ancestors of lizard and mouse. Um, but for example, down here, you see uh, a two by two mapping. So that, that seems to indicate that there was a further 
self-type diversification event uh, and that uh, the, the proper comparison to be made here is not between individual cell types but between groups of cell types. And you can also see uh, that there are some uh, mouse clusters, for example, the two down here, that do not have any counterpart with lizard clusters, again indicating the fact that uh, this method is able to pick up um, uh, also clusters that do not have, uh, uh, that do not correspond to anything in, uh, in other species. Um, all right, so um, this was, so the conservation of Gabbergian neurons was surprising because it was unsuspected. Uh, so let's look now at glutamatergic neurons. And again, this is a mouse data with selected marker genes, many of them tested functionally in uh, mammals. And these marker genes, again, uh, are uh, sufficient to classify uh, glutamatergic neurons in uh, different types. And we know uh, the types roughly correspond to layers. So we have layer two, three, layer four cells, and different types of layer five and layer six cells. What happens now if we look at these same genes in uh, the glutamatergic neurons from the turtle dorsal cortex? And the answer is that these genes are not informative at all. Uh, we see that some of these genes are expressed, many of these genes actually are expressed everywhere in the turtle dorsal cortex. Some of these genes are expressed only in, uh, in some uh, cell types, but their combinatorial code is uh, completely inconsistent with what one could see in a, uh, in a mammalian, in a typical mammalian neocortex. Um, this was very puzzling, and so we, uh, we performed our correlation analysis. We started to look at the different, uh, different clusters and uh, ask the simple question, do their transcriptomes overall correlate in some way? Or is it just, uh, are we just fooled by the selection of, uh, of these uh, mammalian marker genes? And uh, this is what we, we observed by looking at transcriptome correlations. We, we've seen that um, there's no correspondence between individual types uh, of the mammalian neocortex here indicated in rows uh, and individual types of the uh, turtle cortex uh, indicated in columns. But there is a broad uh, resemblance between uh, superficial or upper layer cells um, of, uh, of mammals with some of the cell types in uh, reptiles, which we've called by this upper layer like, and uh, deep, some uh, deep layer cells from, uh, from mammals, and, so layer five and layer six, with uh, cells that we've called deeper layer like cells in, in the turtle. Um, so then we, um, we took marker genes that were specific of these deep layer like cells to try to understand where they were in, um, in the turtle cortex. And remember, um, some ide previous ideas on, uh, uh, on cell types in, uh, in the reptilian cortex were um, saying that uh, homologs to layer five or layer four, for example, could be found, can be found uh, in, sep in separate areas within the, um, the turtle dorsal cortex. But what we've seen instead is that these um, deep layer-like neurons again, identified on the basis of the entire transcriptome, um, are uh, uh, actually forming a, a sub-layer within layer two. So uh, layer two of turtle is subdivided into a superficial uh, layer 2A that molecularly speaking has, um, is similar uh, on the basis of the overall transcriptome to mouse deep layers. And then a deeper layer, layer to B, which is more similar to the mouse, to mouse superficial layers. So this is explained partially by the fact that uh, corticogenesis uh, in reptiles is not uh, following the classical inside out pattern that you see in, uh, in mammals, but is actually outside in. So the early born neurons are, uh, stay superficial in the cortical plate and the late born neurons that are born from uh, uh, progenitors in the ventricular zone are added on uh, more ventrally. And that means that uh, at the transition from, uh, from reptiles to, to mammals, there's been also uh, not only a heavy diversification of uh, neuronal identities, but also an inversion of the cortical genesis uh, gradient. And this is also fitting with uh, some early data on uh, axonal projections because the group of, again, of uh, Kriegstein in the 80s had found that um, the early born neurons in, in the turtle cortex are uh, the corticothalamic projection neurons. So that's similar to uh, the situation of uh, layer six 
neurons in, uh, uh, in mammals, which are all early born and are cortical thalamic projecting. But I want to, uh, to recap a little bit to, uh, to stress the fact that uh, while we have clear uh, indications for homology of GABAergic types and subtypes, because we see uh, con congruence between the expression of effector genes, the ones that determine the neuronal phenotype, and the expression of the transcription factor combinatorial signatures. In the case of um, glutamatergic types, we do see that the transcription factor combinatorial codes that support uh, the, uh, the identity of these neurons are completely different across species. They utilize some of the same components, some of the same transcription factors are there, but, um, but the, these transcription factors are found in combinations that are uh, rather different. So this indicates, uh, this suggests to us at least, that uh, the mammalian cortex, where there is much higher heterogeneity of glutamatergic types, might have um, evolved by the diversification um, of ancestral GABAergic types through a process of cell type diversification. So we think this is, a, this is an example of cell type novelty. Uh, and might have been a driver for also the morphological innovation uh, and the, uh, the uh, um, emergence of a six-layered cortex. And the idea that these are fundamentally quite distinct cell types is supported by anatomy. If you look at morphology, uh, for example, the, your uh, turtle pyramidal neuron doesn't look so much like a typical mammalian pyramidal neuron. If you look at the shapes of these synthetic trees, you can imagine the uh, the implications that um, these differences in morphology can have on, um, on dendritic processing, for example. These dendritic trees span very, in turtles, they span very wide areas. I mean, even up, they cover even up to 5 to 800 microns. Um, and, um, and, there's, um, yeah, and uh, they do not branch out from a, a single apical uh, dendrite, but they all, <laughs> they all uh, branch out more or less directly from the soma. But there is uh, even more mounting evidence on uh, um, coming from uh, beautiful developmental studies from, uh, for example, the Nomura lab and the Victor Borel's lab that show, uh, that show different things. For example, they show uh, that uh, some of the transcription factors that have been associated to upper layer, deep layer like identity uh, in, um, and projection identity in mammals are co-expressed uh, in, uh, in reptiles and birds, consistent with what, exactly what we see with the single cell transcriptomics data, and that uh, these uh, famous uh, transcription factors uh, that direct uh, intracortical or corticofugal identity in mammals, in reality, in, uh, in reptiles and birds, they instruct uh, completely different project, um, uh, projection patterns. So that's to say that projection identity cannot be predicted across uh, species at this very distant um, uh, positions in the in uh, in an animal tree by looking at these uh, transcription factors because these transcription factors have changed uh, their their role and they can extract different projection identities. And uh, the other thing we we are learning from uh, studies on development um, is that also neurogenesis has changed quite dramatically. Not only uh, because of the inversion of the neurogenesis pattern, but also the mode of neurogenesis. There's been a transition from um, a, a direct neurogenesis to indirect neurogenesis in mammals. And so uh, I think this this is important because this might have provided um, an opportunity window. Uh, in evolution for the uh, rearrangement of these um, of these gene regulatory networks and the invention of new cellular identities. Okay, so uh, I spent a long part of my talk talking about dorsal cortex, but I want to tell you something about uh, the remaining parts of uh, of the pallium that we have characterized from reptiles. And uh, so part of it is the the medial cortex, which by its position has been compared uh, consistently with the hippocampus. We do. Uh, we have, we have also looked into this with our molecular data. We do confirm that uh, the medial cortex of reptiles is homologous to uh, the hippocampus of mammals. And what uh, our data enabled us to do was also to look at the finer details. 
and I'm just summarizing this here very quickly, um, we, we essentially, uh, we've been able to, to show with the transcriptomes that uh, not only reptiles have an hippocampus homologue, but they also have the subdivisions of the mammalian hippocampus, because you can recognize uh, the antigyrus homologue and the CA homolog homologue, and then the CA can even, uh, field can even be split into CA1 and CA3. So um, this was exciting because it uh, indicates that the hippocampus uh, is a very ancient structure of the um, of the vertebrate, or at least the amniote brain. And uh, the most significant and uh, outstanding change that, uh, that has happened, uh, the transition to mammals has been the folding of the hippocampus that has taken up this uh, it's a typical um, sausage, sausage sh shape. Uh, so essentially the, uh, the reptilian hippocampus is like a stretched up version of the mammalian hippocampus. But how about the DVR? So um, in, we've done some correlation analysis with, uh, between our uh, or turtle data uh, where we sampled cells throughout the whole pallium and data from uh, very old data, I have to say, from the human uh, pallium. This, was a, uh, this is a microarray data set with many shortcomings, but uh, and it was excellent uh, for, for our purposes, but um, it, it was especially it's microarrays, but it's, it was especially good for us because uh, it's, it, it was at the time the only data set where um, cells or tissue from the entire um, telencell pallium uh, was, um, was sampled from uh, in, within one experiment. And still, uh, so what we would like to do in an ideal case scenario is to take our single cell data from turtle and um, compare them to single cell data from cells sampled from the entire pallium in order to make sense of these mysterious regions like the DVR. Uh, but data sets like that do not exist yet because um, the pallium includes also these very small nuclei like some amygdala nuclei that are very difficult to sample um, for single cell rna -seq. So this is still the best that we have. And uh, from this analysis, by looking at the correlations between the different pallial regions and turtles and different human regions, we have seen uh, that the dorsal cortex has indeed um, transcriptomes that, are, that strongly correlate with transcriptomes from the mammalian uh, neocortex, but also that the DVR has the same correlations uh, with the mammalian neocortex. So that's indicating that uh, the DV the DVR has some features in common with, uh, with neocortex when you look at the entire uh, transcription of the whole picture. However, look, uh, in contrast to, to the dorsal cortex, the DVR also has uh, a correlation with a part of the amygdala, which is called lateral amygdala. Uh, this gets interesting when you limit the analysis to transcription factors. So instead of looking at all the genes, you ask, do these correlations survive if we compare transcription factors, combinatorial codes? And this is based on hundreds of transcription factors expressed in, this, um, in these regions. And the result is quite striking. The transcription factors, combinatorial codes, do not support the similarity between um, neocortex and DVR. And instead, they still maintain that uh, this conclusion that the, DV, the anterior part of the DVR has something to do with the lateral amygdala. And uh, so that's suggesting that uh, a case of uh, uh, potentially of convergent evolution where uh, different combinatorial code, transcription factor combinatorial codes uh, support the expression of similar effect or somewhat similar effector genes in these, two, um, in these two different brain regions. And the idea that the DVR has something to do with, uh, with the lateral amygdala is not completely new because uh, projection data from Bruce and Neary uh, more than uh, about 25 years ago, they they uh, they highlighted the similar some of the similarities between the connecti in the connectivity uh, the axonal input and outputs uh, of the DVR and the and the lateral amygdala. Like uh, they both receive inputs um, from the thalamus. Um, they essentially process uh, different sensory modalities except uh, olfaction, and uh, they project to parts of the hypothalamus uh, to the rest of cortex and striatum. So this is quite interesting, but it needs to be further corroborated by um, uh, comparisons with, uh, with amygdala data from mammals. There is more to it um, because the DVR is heterogeneous. And um, we, we started looking more into the DVR um, after collecting lizard data. And um, we've seen that there is a, a specific cluster of glutamatergic neurons in lizards, uh, which is very distinct 
from the rest of the lizard DVR. This is so distinct from a molecular point of view that there are many genes that are expressed only in these two clusters, actually, uh, you indicated with 19 and 20, and that are found nowhere else in the pallium. And um, these genes are indicated here with these dot plots, where uh, the, these are genes that um, we have used to uh, understand uh, from which part of the DVR these cells, these very distinct cells were coming from. And by doing that, by doing stainings for these, uh, for these particular genes, we have seen that there is a, a region in the lizard DVR that um, no one could recognize from anatomy. We haven't found any indication in the classical anatomical literature um, that saying that this region was distinct from any other parts of the DVR. But uh, transcriptomically and molecularly, this, this region is a completely different thing. And we have called it anterior medial DVR for initially because we, because we didn't have a better name. And we were really intrigued by this and curious to know uh, what this region is. So then we've taken, uh, in this study, we've taken new data from, uh, from mouse. Again, data that were, um, were not, uh, that were more, uh, they were single cell data, were not including uh, the amygdala, but uh, they were still more complete than uh, other data. Uh, so far. And we've seen that uh, we could uh, use these transcriptomic alignment methods that I described earlier to align uh, cells from the hippocampus of, um, of, of mammals that are here in columns to cells from the hippocampus of lizards that are here in rows. And then we've seen that this mysterious region of the DVR had a very high overlap with a particular cluster uh, that um, in, in mammals, in mouse, that uh, Saunders et al. had classified within their dorsal frontal cortex dissections. But then if you look at uh, the molecular markers of this, uh, of this cluster, it's clear that this cluster was not part of the cortex proper, but these were cells um, sampled from underneath the cortex, from a structure uh, that is uh, very mysterious in mammals, very hard to access, and it's called claustrum. So the classroom is, uh, has been implicated in a number of, uh, uh, of hypotheses, including um, implications or like associations to consciousness, but because of its um, deep position in the brain, it's been very difficult to study. And what was very surprising to us was to see that from a molecular point of view, uh, the classroom uh, has many, many similarities to uh, the anterior medial DVR of lizards, but also to another part of the DVR in turtles that I've not uh, talked about, which is called the traditional anatomy literature pallial thickening. And we were very puzzled by this because uh, these, uh, these regions seem to be part of different, uh, seem to be in different positions in the adult brain. This is medial, this is more lateral. But um, part of the problem uh, for understanding this was the fact that we were looking at uh, frontal sections and we were looking at adult uh, structures. If you go back to embryos, it's clear that what these different structures have in common is the fact that they come from, uh, from an anterior and lateral part of the pallium. So the, um, the idea that they are homologous is, uh, is actually very well supported by developmental observations, including some that Luis Puelles and his colleagues have been, uh, um, have been you know, hypothesizing since uh, some time. And what makes this cluster very distinct transcriptomically? So if you just look at the transcriptome uh, of these cells, one thing that um, stands out is that they are the only cells in the, in the pallium, the only glutamatergic cells in the pallium that do co-express uh, receptors for the four main neuromodulators uh, that control brain state in, uh, in, in the brain. So they have receptors for norepinephrine, acetylcholine, dopamine, and serotonin. No other cell, uh, no other glutamatergic cell in the pallium co-expresses robustly these uh, receptors for these four neuromodulators. So that is indicating that this, uh, this lizard classroom is a hub uh, that receives um, and integrates uh, information on brain state. And to confirm that, uh, Lawrence Feng and Xin Shi Li uh, went on to do some um, heroic experiments uh, with uh, tracing is not easy with these animals. And they've basically seen that uh, the classroom in lizards receives input from all these um, uh, neuromodulatory 
brain areas from mesencephalon brainstem hypothalamus, and that relays these um, and that projects to uh, different parts of the cortex in uh, in the lizards. In some cases, they were even able to um, to confirm that uh, they receive uh, projections back from the dorsal cortex in particular. So this uh, pattern of connectivity is consistent not only with the hypothesis that the lizard classroom in integrates information on brain state, but also with the, um, with the typical connectivity pattern of the classroom with the, in mammals, which is reciprocally connected and topographically connected with, uh, with the mammalian neocortex. So that was all, all very nice together because uh, in this case, uh, transcriptomics data, uh, embryological data and uh, connectional data converge uh, on saying that uh, this uh, structure we have identified in the lizard uh, DVR is homologous to the mammalian classroom. What is this doing? This was the question that was driving the work of uh, Lawrence Frank and uh, Hiro Norimoto, uh, who were doing LFP recordings uh, from different parts of the, of the lizard brain, of the lizard telencephalon, to understand the source of uh, sharp wave ripples, which are um, a typical electrophysiological signature of, um, of non... Of, um, non-REM sleep. And what they've seen is that sharp wave ripples were uh, originate in the in the classroom of uh, of lizards and then they spread to the DVR and to the and to the cortex. And uh, this is a, a sharp wave ripple by the way which is a deflection of the long um, uh, of the local field potential uh, that um, uh, coincides with a high uh, frequency spike spiking of neurons. And, um, and you see the alternation here of sharp wave ripples during slow wave sleep. Uh, uh, you see the sharp wave ripples during slow wave sleep alternating with the phases of REM sleep where uh, you don't see the, uh, these, uh, these strong deflections of the LFP. And what they've seen also is that if you, uh, if you inactivate the classroom, the sharp wave ripples are gone. Uh, so that's really showing causally that uh, the, the classroom is the source of these sharp wave ripples, which has important implications on understanding sleep and understanding the role of, uh, for example, replay during sleep in the consolidation of memories. All right, uh, so to summarize, we, we've seen that uh, with single cell transcriptomics, we, we can generate higher resolution cell type atlases for new or non-conventional animal models. And this can help us uh, to use these models for um, to gain interesting insights on brain evolution. More in particular, we've seen that cortical circuits are mosaics of neuron types that have uh, different evolutionary histories. So neurons do not ev evolve at the same pace. Uh, some neurons are more conserved than others. And in the case of cortex, the gabbergic neurons are uh, re remarkably conserved uh, and glutamatergic neurons can be divergent if you compare the three-layered to the six-layered cortex. And uh, we've also seen that uh, morphologies are, uh, so the overall neuroanatomy is in par partially disentangled. Uh, you can disentangle neuroanatomy from a neuronal identity in parts because you can recognize these uh, very well conserved ancient neuron types, like the classroom or, or the hippocampus neurons, um, in brain regions that otherwise um, would not be very well comparable because of their overall morphology. So what that's saying is that um, embryonic development can shape brain, uh, brains in different ways. Uh, they can lead to different site architectonic uh, features, but yet uh, in some features of the cell types will, will be, can be conserved. And this is uh, something we can, um, we can recognize only if we can compare uh, cell types directly. Okay, so in the few minutes that I've left, I want to go back to this picture uh, because I've been showing you um, all the, these sections through the telencephalon of different tetrapods, but I've not mm, annotated uh, the salamander here. And uh, it is, uh, it, this is because we don't really have um, a, a clear uh, way to, uh, a clear understanding of, uh, of the amphibian brain. So uh, classically speaking, the amphibian brain has a, has a pallium. This pallium has been uh, characterized or subdivided into different regions. So we talk about the medial pallium, a dorsal pallium, maybe a lateral pallium and a ventral pallium. But uh, there is, um, um, by definition, this dorsal, this pallium is not a cortex because it doesn't have a layered structure. And this is definitions uh, that we might be able to revisit once we uh, look more in depth into this and uh, we understand more about these brains from a molecular and cell type point of view. Um, 
the the other the other um, the other point is that it's not clear whether there is anything uh, related to the DVR in um, in anamniotes. Uh, what I've shown you is that uh, the DVR can be compared to uh, on the basis of this transcriptomics data to the classroom and to the amygdala of mammals. So that's suggesting that DVR uh, the origin of the, some features of the DVR might have existed even before uh, amniotes and uh, that further elaboration diversification of um, of a smaller compartment uh, that might have existed already in um, in um, in um, uh, tetrapod ancestors so these are the kind of questions that uh, we don't have answers for and uh, this is um, one of the reasons why i think uh, studying amphibian brains can be uh, valuable for understanding uh, more in general the evolution of the telencephalon in, uh, in tetrapods we have focused on the on this species the spanish rib news uh, for a number of reasons there are phylogenetic positions that I've already discussed. Um, one interesting point, though, is that salamanders and frogs diverged uh, very long ago, more or less at the same time when uh, reptiles and mammals um, diverged. So this is a very ancient split in uh, also in vertebrate brain evolution. They have a single brain, and in particular, salamander, salamander brain is one of the smallest brains of all uh, of all vertebrates. Uh, it's, for example, simpler and smaller than the brain of a, of a frog. And uh, we, we started measuring brain volumes. We've seen that uh, the brain of a salamander is about the size of the factory bulb of a mouse. So we, uh, this extreme simplicity, uh, I think, can help us to scale up our studies to, to systems levels, to, to look at the entire forebrain or uh, even at the entire brain at once. And Pleurodelis, uh, like Axolotl, which is another very prominent uh, salamander model, um, as a number of tools, the genome, a transcriptome, genome editing, we can make transgenic lines, um, and it's easy to keep and breed in, uh, in captivity. These are some uh, uh, pictures from our first animals in the lab. Uh, this is uh, one of our first behavioral experiments where you see the uh, Pleurodelis doing its typical uh, duck, uh, ducking behavior, which is a behavior they do when they search for food. And these are our first embryos, uh, which um, were born by spontaneous breeding when we, we had to go into shutdown. Uh, so it was a very unfortunate coincidence, but very encouraging. We're looking forward to going back to the lab. And this is their simple brain. Look at the scale bar. This is uh, <laughs> extremely small. And um, we, uh, this is a section through the telencephalon. And we started staining for uh, different marker genes. Many of these genes, uh, actually uh, come from um, our, um, come from our understanding of the, of the reptilian brain and that's uh, I have to say the reptilian brain helps understanding the um, uh, the amphibian brain uh, so there are many hypotheses that come from the reptilian work that can be tested here and you see from these stains that uh, this um, this pallid region that is seemingly very homogeneous from here to here, it's in reality subdivided into into different uh, uh, in, dif in different regions that have different molecular they express different molecular markers. So if I zoom more on this particular section, see that uh, just with two antibodies we we can recognize different neuron types. We can see that uh, this molecular layer, which uh, comprises axons and dendrites, is somewhat organized because uh, this antibody. Uh, picks up a, fa a, a bundle of axons that come into the forebrain. And uh, so there is a lot here to, uh, to understand and to uncover. And we are going to focus on two main um, uh, broad topics. One of the reasons why we want to study these animals, which are able to genetic manipulation, among other things, is to uh, study uh, comparatively mechanisms of neuronal di diversification, because the, the neuronal type repertoire here is still more, much more limited than what you would find in a reptile or in a mammal. We hope that by studying uh, uh, development and gene regulatory networks uh, in, these, um, in these animals, we can uh, understand a little bit more um, about um, the mechanisms driving the evolution of new neuronal identities. But uh, the other aspect that we want to go into is more in the, for the future is to uh, connect neuronal identities to the evolution of circuits uh, because um, uh, neurons have to wire up into circuits, but if uh, the case, for example, of GABAergic neurons illustrates that 
Uh, neurons can evolve at different paces. Uh, some neurons can be more conserved than others, but yet they uh, wire up in, um, uh, together in, uh, in circuitry in, to make long and long range circuits. And the question is, how do changes in um, um, the molecular identity of, of neurons in the telencephalon um, affect uh, the way these neurons are wired? Uh, what are the constraints that uh, are acting on the evolution of circuits themselves? Um, okay, so um, I have two acknowledgement slides. Uh, one is for my uh, postdoc lab, uh, and in particular for my uh, postdoc mentor, Gilles Laurent, who has supported these, uh, these big projects and new projects for his lab, I have to say. And all the people that, uh, with whom I've worked, uh, so Tracy, Robert, Ariel, and Georgi, were um, working, uh, we were working together on the turtle uh, data, and Tatiana and David uh, have taken on some uh, very heroic work on, on the lizards, some of it I've shown. And I also want to thank my new home, uh, Columbia. So my lab that is still growing, this is a lab picture, uh, the kind of pictures you can take nowadays. And uh, this is, um, uh, so these are the pioneers, uh, and uh, we're looking for, for postdocs, as uh, Denis mentioned. And uh, I also want to thank, in particular, the lab of Andras Simon and Alberto Joven in the Simon lab. They are Karolinska. They've been working on uh, Pleurodeles, on our uh, new species, for a few years. And they've been really instrumental in helping us uh, to get started with this new animal model. And yeah, so thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. Let me close the, um, the video. You should be back on the live stream. Mm -hmm. If you close your... Um, yes. Yeah, you're seeing, you're yeah. seeing I, I guess you're seeing on the right, you see these virtual applauds that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that relate to your non-virtual data. So that was uh, really fantastic. I look forward to the, to the salamander data. This, this seems like a pretty exciting uh, model. Um, so the time comes to um, to go through the question and answers. I don't think you're seeing the, the questions here that I'm opening in my screen. So uh, I'll just read them out loud. And uh, there's quite a few of them. So expand on what you think is interesting. And if there's some compact answers to give it, to be given, then just go ahead. So okay. uh, the first, actually, that, the first one is one that I had asked. Uh, what is known about the processes that have driven the inversion of the corticogenesis from uh, outside in in reptiles to inside out in mammals. Are there, what, what are the speculations there? Uh, to, I, I don't know, uh, don't know much about it. So uh, I, I, don't, uh, I don't recall any specific speculation on that either. Uh, I might be missing something now, but uh, I'm not aware of um, specific ideas. There, I mean, there's obvious places to look at. Uh, there is uh, the role of radial glia, mm -hmm. um, and there is the role of cal retus cells. So now uh, you know that car knockout of reeling in mammals uh, leads to some sort of inversion of, uh, of corticogenesis. Mm -hmm. It's not a complete inversion. Uh, detailed molecular studies have seen have shown that it's actually more of a mirror image of, of the mm -hmm. layers. Mm -hmm. This is work from Ed Lean and uh, at the Allen Institute. But there is something about cal retus cells, and uh, cal retus cells, from what we know, uh, do not exist in uh, uh, non mammals. Uh, they've not been uh, found uh, yet. Uh, there is a nice study, for example, from uh, Fernando uh, Garcia Moreno in birds, uh, where he has shown that uh, there's no migration uh, of, of neurons from any of the uh, regions that would give rise to uh, carotid cells. And if Fernando is there, he can correct me if I'm saying something wrong. So yeah, this is one place to look at. But, but is there anything such as a pre-plate splitting in the reptiles? <laughs> No, not that I know. Mm -hmm. and so Th it, this has not been studied. In, oh, not that I know, no. And it's correct that the, the thalamocortical afferents, they come from, from the top, right? In the reptiles yes. and then dig down, just like in the reader, in fact. Exactly, exactly. Okay. All right. Um, second question is, uh, oh, wait, let me click on that so I can read it. Uh, thanks for these exciting works from uh, Lizu at UCSF. Are there any unique cell types in each species? Yes, I mean, uh, in a way, the uh, we, the DVR is a, 
um, is a candidate where to look for unique cell types. Uh, but we, because we're missing the mammalian, complete mammalian data set, we cannot make these statements conclusively. But it's, um, it's likely that part of the DVR is, um, has, has evolved through diversification of, uh, or complexification of simpler cell types. That's something you know, to be tested. In the hippocampus of uh, reptiles, we see uh, very strange glutamatergic neurons that uh, do not have any clear counterpart to mammals. So that's uh, it's a very specific type. They are expressing vasopressin. Uh, I don't know of any uh, finding of vasopressin expression in uh, mammalian hippocampus. This is a sparse population of neurons. This is another example. So there are examples like this, yes. Okay. In the meantime, Fernando confirmed you are absolutely <laughs> right, of course. Uh, a question from, well, from Fernan Fernando, actually. Assuming that GABAergic interneurons and projecting neurons co-evolved co 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 within circuits, would that explain the high conservation of interneurons versus the wider diversity of glutamatergic neurons? That's that's an odd question. So uh, there there are two um, two broad uh, hypotheses that you can think, um, that could explain the conservation of GABAergic neurons. One is to imagine that there are uh, developmental constraints uh, and genetic factors. These neurons are specified in the subpallium by progenitors that are maybe more conserved because uh, they also give rise to basal ganglia and striatum and other very conserved brain regions. Um, also, making a GABAergic neuron is uh, neuron is is more complex than making making a glutamatergic neuron because uh, GABAergic neurons express a whole battery of genes that are related to the synthesis of GABA, the packaging of GABA. Whereas glutamatergic neurons uh, have only one gene, which is the V, uh, the vesicular glutamate transporter, that packages uh, the glutamate into vesicles. And there's nothing else that uh, molecularly makes, biochemically, you know, makes a neuron a glutamatergic neuron. Um, so the, the other way the to look... The one or the VGLUT2? Is there a difference it's, there? Okay, uh, it's... Uh, we have both, actually. Ah. That's, that's very, very strange about reptiles. They have both. Uh, in mm -hmm. mammals, they, they separate, uh, but I never remember which one it was. <laughs> which yeah, the where, two but, is first. Yeah. yeah. But in, in reptiles, it's both. And the other way to look at the question is to imagine there are functional constraints. This maybe these GABAergic neurons do something very uh, important in cortical networks. Uh, they maintain excitatory inhibitory balance, and um, and this uh, they are involved in disinhibition or other things, that, other computations that are conserved at some level. And this is, for example, one of the hypotheses we want to test. I see. Related to the interneurons, so the HTR3A, so the serotonin transporter subtypes, is uh, CG derived, presumably evolutionarily more recent, at least evo-devo wise, uh, born later, ending up mostly in superficial layers. Uh, do you see any subtype specific differences in the conservation of the interneuron subtypes across uh, these species? No, the, 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 in reality, the, scenario, the things are very patchy. So the, the CG derived interneurons are conserved. Um, and uh, so in that sense, the fact that they're born later, that they go to superficial layers, it's not, uh, mm, it's not predictive in this particular case of their con mm, conservation. So that was a big surprise history. to me when I read your paper. I, I, would, I would not have predicted that there would be CG, equivalent of CG derived neurons in, in, in earlier species or in, in reptiles. If you don't yeah. Right, and this was a surprise to us also. Uh, for example, one thing I haven't uh, shown is that there is a subtype of CG derived neurons that are the uh, neuroglia form and DNF positive neurons that are in layer one and only in layer one in mammals. And they are sub PL also, and uh, they do exist in turtles, and they are sub PL. So even their, their distribution uh, is, uh, is consistent. And it's, I mean, in a way, the inversion of the corticogenesis uh, gradient does not um, impact mm -hmm. the distribution of GABAergic neurons. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you, we've done, for example, stains for CG markers, CG neuron markers and somatostatin, mm -hmm. and you see that uh, CG neurons are more prominently in layer one and maybe layer two of mm -hmm. turtles. So there is a little bit of a bias towards, a little bit towards superficial layers. Maybe their position has to do with uh, the way they connect to it's interesting uh, because in the mammals where there are disruptions of the layers, then you have the you have the interneurons that follow the position. There was this this work uh, yeah. from the Arlotta lab where there were heterotopic uh, cells uh, from Simona Lodato uh, 
uh, and where the proper compl complement of interneurons was attracted to. So, so it would mean a different mechanism of guidance? Or? Maybe, maybe. I don't know. Okay. We don't know. <laughs> Nipun uh, Basfour asks, uh, well, or says, thanks for a fascinating talk. Um, think, thinking of electrophysiology, are there conserved cortical computations? from reptiles to mammals, what about behavior? What is the cortex pallium required for in reptiles? These are the big questions and we don't know. Uh, we simply don't know. So there was a, a beautiful study from, uh, the, from Gilles Laurent's lab uh, looking at the turtle cortex, uh, which is traditionally described as a visual cortex because it receives input from the LGN. And um, in this study, they looked at the uh, at receptive fields, uh, trying to see whether you could find in turtles the same receptive kind of receptive fields that you see in, um, in mammals. And the answer is no. Uh, so uh, this part of the cortex is using, presumably is using visual information in a completely different way. So um, this is speaking of, of reptiles. Then there is a uh, nice work from, uh, from the Grivner lab uh, on uh, lampreys that is uh, pointing to many surprising similarities uh, between uh, projection types and even electrophysiological properties between mammals and, uh, and uh, lampreys. And uh, I think there are exciting things uh, there, but uh, also many questions because lampreys are so remote from, uh, um, from mammals. Yeah, so to be investigated. <laughs> okay, uh, one question from Iko Suzuki. Some of the marker genes you used are uh, transcription factors, which are mainly working during embryogenesis as determinants of neural subtypes. How do you think of trying similar analysis in the embryo? Is it possible to correlate well mouse pyramidal subtypes and the reptile counterparts compared to the analysis in the adult? I guess, yeah, this is hardcore evo devil. So what do you think about the developmental trajectories of these different cell types in, in reptile versus mammals? Can you speculate or do you have data? We don't have data. We, we, in part, we want to look into this one. I was saying we want to look at the mechanism of neural diversification. Mm -hmm. um, one speculation would be that uh, maybe these transcription factors that uh, get uh, that segregates to different subtypes in mammals, they would maintain this uh, co-expression patterns in uh, also in progenitors and then later on in differentiated neurons. Mm -hmm. And uh, what uh, people have seen, for example, by studying C. elegans is that uh, you can specify subtypes of neurons by introducing repress repressors. So uh, one very wild view of speculation would be that uh, new neuronal identities in, uh, in mammals might have evolved through uh, new repressive uh, mechanisms that segregate or yeah. these different transcription factors. And it's, in part, there is evidence of this in uh, the work of, uh, uh, Nomura, of the Nomura lab, where they, uh, they show that uh, in, uh, in birds, uh, the uh, enhancers, the regulatory elements that are responsible of CTIP2 repression by SATB2 are weaker. They are not present or they are weaker. So there is something about the regulation of these two the repression of CTP2 by SATP2 that has changed, that is different between birds and mammals. Huh. Yeah, I guess then the, the next question somehow directly relates to that. I often get the, the impression from ICC or in C2 that, quote unquote, everything is expressed in the hippocampus, mm -hmm. that somehow cell type diversification might have emerged from gene repression rather than induction. Uh, well, there's two questions there. First, is it true that, is there any, you know, direct evidence that the hippocampus expresses a lot uh, and what might be the respective roles of repression and induction of genes in evolution? Yeah, so the, uh, the respective role of answer, the second part, kind yeah. of answered, yeah. So, so for the hippocampus, uh, there is, uh, I think there's more and more work coming up on the hippocampus that is indicating that there are different uh, subtypes of neurons in the hippocampus, uh, depending on where you're looking at, uh, dorsal versus ventral hippocampus, or even within uh, the, the hippocampus itself, there's some uh, distinction between the more superficial and deeper neurons. Um, so yes, the hippocampus seems to express many of these genes. I mean, overall, the pallium is expressing many of these genes. If you look at the piriform cortex, it's again the same transcription factors that are again used in different combinations. So one speculation is that uh, this was a cocktail of uh, transcription factors that was there, was around in uh, pallium evolution for a very long time. And then these genes have been repurposed in a very plastic way um, in different species and different parts of the pallium in the same species. Hmm. Okay. 
Uh, next question is from Shuba Tole. Hi, Shuba. Uh, fantastic talk. Do you think the mammalian cortex is intrinsically a better strategy for higher brain function, or could outside in cortex expand it tang tangentially, if not radially, could also have achieved the connectivity required for it? I guess it relates to the degrees of freedom, the extent to which uh, the spatial uh, uh, layout of neurons within a circuit constrain the type of computation that can be made. Yes, and uh, I, <laughs> <laughs> lots of speculations today. Well, uh, there is uh, there is one reality is that the DVR is equally good at uh, high com high complex functions. You know, some birds are more are smarter than some many mammals. So, and the DVR does not have a layered uh, organization, at least not mm -hmm. layered in the same way as a mammalian uh, isocortex or neocortex. So um, there is, of course, the overarching question is, what are layers good for? They, they are good for, for, I presumably, for organizing inputs and outputs uh, to have a more streamlined, unorganized signal processing. But uh, it's clear that, uh, uh, so you see layers also in the optic tectum, which is the homolog of the superior colliculus, and uh, that in birds or in reptiles is beautiful. It's, uh, it's like, in comparison, the, the if you look at a reptile, the cortex in comparison is nothing. It's like uh, insignificant. Uh, the tectum is fantastic. Huh? And uh, so this is probably something uh, about the organizing inputs and outputs, but it's clear also that uh, some brains can do without layers. And the DVR of uh, birds is a good example. So again, we don't have a good answer here. How can you say the birds are smarter? I mean, I, I'm happy to believe they're smart, very smart, but how could you say they're smarter than mammals for some oh. tasks? How, how can you compare that? I oh, guess yeah, this funny is... tasks with, except for bats. But... This is not my field. It's just what I'm, I'm reading uh, from other people's work. So I, it's not my field, but it's true that some birds have remarkable memory yeah. and uh, you know cognitive abilities. and uh, Yeah, but of course, this is... This, way, I mean, this might have been an overstatement. That is not my yeah. expertise. I mean, they have, yeah, long-term memories, the corvids, right? They can recognize mm -hmm. individuals. And uh, I don't know to which extent it compares with what mammals can do. I, I, I don't know how you could compare that, by the way. It's kind of hard to... Yeah, okay. it's, it's different evolutionary stories, different yeah. strategies. And, yeah. yeah. Uh, a question from Maria. Uh, are there many reptile-specific genes expressed in the reptilian brain? And how do they affect comparisons to mammals? So basically, I guess it's a question on genes that would be specific as opposed to cell types. Yeah, we, we, have, not done, we have not done that kind of analysis. Uh, when we do our comparative analysis, we, we limit ourselves to one-to-one -one orthologs, uh, which is about half, uh, half of the genome, half of, you know, half of the genes, because you cannot compare one to many orthologs. It's not a meaningful comparison because you, you're, you don't know about uh, neo-functionalization or or sub-functionalization. So uh, I don't have an answer to that question. OK. In the meantime, somebody answered that some corvids are indeed <laughs> smarter than primates. If uh, from George Bachero, if, if you have a, OK, well, yeah, people, people, Victor also says definitely <laughs> smarter. So if you have papers on that, direct comparisons of primates and, and corvids, that would be interesting. I think okay. Victor is thinking about some primates, like, <laughs> OK, yeah. let's not go political here, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, then, um, oh yeah, I guess that was a joke actually from Victor, definitely smarter than some primates. Okay, yeah, yeah. good thing you added the little laughing face, uh, Victor, <laughs> I didn't get it. Okay, um, and actually some birds are better than most mammals, exactly like a few mammals are better than most birds. Okay, yeah, this is getting philosophical. All right, uh, thank you for a beautiful, beautiful talk from Katie. Uh, did you find genes specific to glutamatergic neurons in turtle whose spatial profile may reflect the mediolateral organization you presented in your intro that could relate to inside-out lamination in mammals? Um, so, like, areas that would correspond to layers? No, not really. Uh, so, our... Uh, so it's true that in what's uh, classically defined as cortical, uh, dorsal cortex, there are multiple areas. But, um, uh, and these are the areas that have been compared to different layers in the past. But uh, our analysis is suggesting that actually uh, these areas are different thing. And they, it's in, again, it's not super con solid and conclusive because we, we are missing um, a good mammalian counterpart for, uh, for uh, overall 
comprehensive comparison. But we think that what has been labeled as layer five uh, in the past is probably corresponding to subiculum or to these areas and at the transition at the band in the transition between the hippocampus and the and the isocortex hmm. and torana subiculum. So, what but this is you know, of, of cortical areas. Um, we haven't seen a, uh, many more areas besides this broad distinction between anterior and posterior cortex. Maybe if we were sampling more cells, we will see something, but I, uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because uh, some, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, from Katie, thank you for a beautiful talk and work. Did you find, oh no, that, sorry. <laughs> I just had that one. Mm -hmm. um, I guess. I guess the Corvid would have figured that out too. Uh, are the connectivity patterns and function of the three GABAergic classes more or less the same in reptiles compared to mammalian brain? For instance, PV cells targeting the somas and gating the activity or the VIP being disinhibitory, et cetera? Nobody knows yet. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's, so that's a, one of the big questions, yeah. Sure, yeah. Um, the overlap in the UMAPs between species is remarkable. Um, does it have, one, does it have the resolution to find new cell types? Two, how does it look for the glutamatergic cells? Well, the glutamatergic cells was the second part of the talk or the middle part. Mm -hmm. But I guess um, when the cell types, we had a question on that too, unless you want to comment more on that. Yeah, so, uh, yes, the overlap is good. I've not presented it for the glutamatergic cells because the plot is just confusing, but I've presented this big matrix uh, with the classroom uh, data also. And I, I forgot to point this out, but uh, you, you, don't see the, the, you don't see good overlaps between the clusters coming from the dorsal cortex of lizard in that case, and uh, the clusters from the different uh, cortical layers. Hmm. And okay. yes, this analysis has the potential of uh, discovering distinct cell types. We, we're still exploring a little bit these tools because it's not uh, entirely clear how much you can push them, but uh, they, they work remarkably well. Interesting, okay. In the meantime, Pablo tells us that even the ducks are similar to mammals or humans in abstract thinking. So yeah, I, <laughs> we'll have to <laughs> click on that link. <laughs> All right. Um, based on this data, uh, this is a question from Philippe Vernier. Uh, based on this data, it seems very difficult to infer what would have been the ancestral organization of stem amniotes, since crow crown mammals are more ancient than sauropsids ancestors. It is, however, obvious that it is impossible to say that the six-layered cortex of mammals is more modern than the three-layered cortex of lizards and turtles. Do you agree with this? I agree with this, um, and uh, I agree also with the, the idea that it's hard to infer uh, the state of uh, stem amniotes. It could even be that uh, this, the, this whole idea, I mean, there is some speculation that the, three la the, the amniote cortex was not three-layered at all, and that uh, this, this layering has evolved uh, independently in, uh, um, in reptiles and mammals. That's still possible. But mm -hmm. um, I think, I don't know really how much this really matters, because uh, I think um, looking at cell types is more powerful. In this case, I can imagine having a situation where homologous cell types can be found, even uh, if in some cases they're organized in layers and some other cases they're not. Um, so this, this is why we want to look at the amphibians now. Okay, so what are crown mammals? So uh, the mammals that, uh, that got extinct that are uh, that existed before the modern okay. that split out and existed before modern ones. Right. Okay. All right. Uh, a few more questions. Is it possible that two cell types are homologous, but there's but that their set of transcription factors um, uh, diversified and are not similar anymore? Basically, are there different ways? You're asking whether there's different ways to make brains, or are there different ways to make the same neuron? Yeah, in, in theory, it's possible. Uh, what I presented at the beginning as a conceptual outline on how to compare neurons was very general, very theoretical, and we need to learn to to do more of this kind of work to learn more. Uh, and I think, uh, as I pointed out, it's important to put this data in, in a broader context and, uh, and come up with a unifying scenario. So in this particular case, I think uh, the interpretation we've given is supported by what we know from embryonic development. Uh, 
we still have to understand how connectivity patterns have changed and why they seem to be so valuable. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, this is what we can conclude so far. We can exclude that uh, some cell types might, uh, you know, uh, still remain the same, but change so much their, uh, like come from a common ancestor, but still change so much the regulatory code that uh, they become completely, uh, the, the regulatory codes become completely indistinguishable. But it seems unlikely in a vertebrates where the early development is so constrained. Okay. So we have a few more questions. Maybe if, if, uh, if there's um, the opportunity to have short answers, then it's, it's great. We could go through all of them in a broader view. <laughs> although all of the questions like this one, I don't know how you're going to answer it shortly. In a broader view, what's the relationship between cell type diversity and brain function intelligence? <laughs> <laughs> you have two sentences. No, any comment on that? The relationship, do you, I would, I would say maybe if I can rephrase this, more cell types equals more diversity, more plasticity, more um, adaptation to different um, environments? Well, more cell types equals more complexity uh, to, certain, to some extent, and more complexity might be uh, good for more sophisticated functions, but uh, there's, we don't have hard measurements on this. No. Great presentation. I was wondering if there's any evidence of explant of PDVR or some some mammal regions or some mammal regions in the reptiles to see the consequence. So basically, transspecies trans, uh, transplantations. Uh, if not, we can expect a mammalization or reptilization of the brain. So what do you think? How well, uh, cell autonomous? How cell autonomous is all that? At least I, I don't know of anything. I, I just know of some experiments where uh, in Pax 6 mutants, this is very experiments from very long ago, you, you get, a, I believe, an expansion of the ventral pallium. Uh, but OK, don't quote me on that. It's, yeah. Okay. Uh, cerebellum? Cerebellum? Yeah, is it, is it conserved? <laughs> <laughs> the literature says, yes, we've not looked into this. Yeah, OK. Would you bet that it's more conserved than the cortex cell types? Mm, I, I would not bet anything at this point. Uh, what we we what we've in our study were so many surprises that uh, I'm open to anything more. Okay. Uh, something about the evolution of transcription factors in primates versus mouse. Mm, yeah, it's not really my no. my core expertise. Difficult there, yeah. Um, is your DVR to clostrum, clostrum comparison based on all genes or only the transcription factors? All genes. I mean, that big matrix I've shown with the mapping, uh, it's uh, based on the entire transcriptome. Okay. And then maybe the, well, the last question. Okay, two more. Um, mm -hmm. is it, what, what's the origin of GABAergic interneurons in uh, reptiles? Is there a region similar to the ganglionic MS? Yes, yes. So this was work from um, Zoltan Molnar, among others, uh, who have shown that uh, there is migration uh, from the ganglionic eminences, exactly like in a mammal. Okay. And I'll pick the last one. Sorry for those of you who, if you, if you have pressing questions, I'm sure Maria is happy to answer them by email. Of course. I'll pick, um, what about glial cells? Ha! Huh. <laughs> so we see oligodendrocytes, we see microglia. And then astrocytes are interesting because uh, basically in reptiles you have uh, ependymoglial cells that are like the remnant of uh, radial glia. Mm -hmm. And these ependymoglial cells express uh, astrocyte markers, but they also express ependymal cells markers. And um, they, they still express stem, stemness markers. So they are the reservoir, stem cell reservoir uh, that su supports adult neurogenesis because these brains keep on growing and there is adult neurogenesis throughout the entire pallium. Hmm. So it seems like that. Diversity of astrocytes, I guess there's not that much, right? Uh, no. So anatomically, people have shown uh, that there are some, in reptiles, some astrocytes that are not radial glia, so that they look more like typical astrocytes of mammals. Uh, but we, we couldn't identify them transcriptomically. Probably we haven't sampled enough cells to see them. Okay. All right, so we're reaching the end of the um, allotted uh, time. Maria, thanks again for not only the, the presentation, but the nice uh, discussion. Uh, these are always uh, interesting issues to discuss. And the answers, uh, the speculative answers are sometimes more inspiring than the ones for which we, we, we have uh, data. So, but we're, 
you know, moving in the, in the direction um, of getting more answers. Um, next week, the next Thursday, the guest will be Laurent Nguyen uh, from the University of Liège. I'd like to highlight that there's also um, on Tuesday at 5 p.m. in Europe, in continental Europe, a uh, presentation by Chris Walsh in the other um, seminar series uh, spearheaded by uh, Gaia Novarino. So um, some of you might find it interesting too. Um, until then, that's it for me. I wish you all a pleasant week and see you uh, next uh, Thursday um, at the same time. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.